Hi, Rock Buddies, it's Papa. Look what I have under the Christmas tree for you this Christmas. Let's open the box and see what you got. Look, it's a bunch of rocks and minerals for you. And I'm going to tell you about each and every one of them. On the left in the test tube, we have thin flakes of gold from the Dahlonega Gold Belt. As you know, gold is a, an element, a mineral, and a metal. On the right, we have fool's gold. I don't know where it came from. Fool's gold is iron pyrite. That's iron plus sulfur, or iron plus sulfate. And gold and fool's gold are both often found together. Whenever you have any kind of volcanic activity going on, whether it be rifting or subduction or continental crashing, you can get gold. And not only can you get gold, but you can get iron and sulfur and copper and lead. This is a picture of what happened off the coast of Georgia during the Taconic Mountain Building event. You can see the black ocean crust on the right is subducted underneath an island arc. It actually created this volcanic island arc. And in between the island arc and the mainland are sediments that are being flushed full of, that's right, Dahlonega gold. Since both iron and sulfur are injected into these environments by volcanic activity, creating this fool's gold, many a would-be miner has been confused by this iron pyrite and hence the name fool's gold. After plate tectonics activities inject the crust with these very valuable metals, we dig them out and melt them down to purify them into very useful commodities. On the left, we have copper ore. This copper ore was injected into rocks of the Great Smoky group of rocks, mainly Meta Greywack back also during the Taconic Mountain Building event. And here is blue glass slag that was produced in the old time iron furnaces. These old time iron furnaces were open at the top and they would put in a layer of iron ore and then a layer of coal and then a layer of limestone and repeat those layers over and over again. They would inject air um, into this mix and set it on fire to get it super hot. The molten iron, which they called pig iron, would come dripping out of the mouth of this furnace and all the impurities would be collected in hunks of glass that they called slag. And if there was copper in that glass, it would taint the glass kind of a bluish color like we have here. This is kyanite. It comes from a place in Georgia called Graves Mountain. It came to us as a part of a large microcontinent that crashed into proto-North America during the Acadian orogeny around 350 million years ago. The large microcontinent did not crash into Georgia or North Carolina. It crashed from Virginia north. And after it crashed, it all of its sediments eroded into a huge basin called the Catskill Delta. Then it began to move south. As this microcontinent moved south toward Georgia and North Carolina, it left a trail of granite plutons all up and down the eastern United States as it mashed and smashed its way down, pushing the land crust down into the mantle where the rocks were melted and new granite plutons created. Not only that, but the sand and the mud that lay along the coast of uh, North Carolina and Georgia was severely uh, smashed and crashed and metamorphosed in the presence of hot volcanic fluids and hot water and this created kyanite. During the Acadian orogeny and later during the Alleghenian orogeny when Africa crashed, these kyanite rich sediments were pushed up into huge folds, especially in North Carolina and because the kyanite is very hard and resistant to erosion and weathering, it now forms the highest peak east of the Mississippi River called Mount Mitchell. 
Ah, here we have lovely quartz crystals on the left and amethyst crystals on the right. You know, quartz takes many forms. And if it's allowed to expand to its most beautiful crystal structure, you get these beautiful six-sided crystals. And if quartz is exposed to radon, which is a radioactive gas that's in many granite plutons, it can form into amethyst. As you know, quartz is made of silicon and oxygen, and so is amethyst, but there are always tiny bits of impurities in the quartz, and the radon gas accentuates these impurities, imparting the beautiful purple color. If you leave the amethyst out in the sun, what happens? Right, it fades back kind of to quartz. And speaking of quartz, silicon dioxide, here we have three more forms of it, all with some amounts of impurities in them. First, we have black obsidian or volcanic glass. This occurs when uh, felsic pyroclastic material, uh, material rich in quartz is blown out of a volcano and it lands right into water or thick snow or ice and cools so fast that no crystals have any chance to form. And so you get this glass-like structure. Impurities in the glass-like structure cause it to be black. Next up, we have milky quartz, same stuff, silicon dioxide, but in this case, there are many, many ultra-tiny little inclusions of air and water that give it a milky look to it. Uh, in the Piedmont province of Georgia and other states where chert was not readily available always, the Indians used milky quartz to make their arrowheads and spear points. Milky quartz is a type of vein quartz. That's the kind of quartz rocks you find all over the place in the Piedmont and Mountain Province in the creeks and in creek banks. It's where the crystal structure is not definite, so we call that amorphous crystal structure. And finally, here's some really pretty examples of flint or chert arrowheads. Flint and chert are basically the same thing. If it's gray or black, they often call it flint but chert slash flint forms in oceans, often times in limestone strata, where sand from sand dunes, tiny sand from sand dunes is blown off of the dunes into the limey mud at the bottom of the ocean and gets consolidated into chert. You can also find chert formations way out in the deep ocean basin where infinitely tiny particles of, of quartz drift way out into the deep cold reaches of the ocean and lay down and that's formed that's called bedded chert unlike obsidian which has absolutely no crystal structure chert does have a crystal structure but the crystals are so small they're microscopic that's called cryptocrystalline chert here's some crystals that look like quartz but no they're calcium carbonate crystals and unlike quartz, you can scratch them with a nickel coin. Calcium carbonate forms in a rock called limestone. Where does the calcium and the carbonate of calcite come from? Well, in the ocean, all the sea creatures that use shells, including coral reefs, take carbon dioxide and calcium from the ocean and put it together to form calcite. When they die, their bodies sink down to the ocean mud and are mashed and crashed over the eons into limestone. In this picture of a limestone rock, you can see streaks of calcium carbonate crystals, which you can scratch with a nickel coin. If those streaks were made of quartz, which they do look like, you could not scratch them with a nickel coin. You would have to get a knife blade to scratch them with. So that's a good way to tell quartz from calcite. If you have a lot of volcanic eruptions that produce abundant magnesium and the right warm tropical climate conditions, a lot of the calcite in limestone can repla be replaced by magnesium, in which case you get a rock called dolomite. In this picture, which is the Taconic mountain building event, the same one that pumped the Dahlonega gold into the uh, sediments, 
when the Big Island Arc pushed down on the continent, it made that big bulge that we see that's called a four bulge and all that pink material, which is limestone and dolomite, was raised up above the surface of the ocean and it began to weather and later on it was pumped full by the Acadian mountain building event of mostly iron but also interesting elements such as barium. This is a barite rose and it's made mostly of the element barium. And this barium along with lots of iron was pumped into a formation uh, called the Shady Dolomite that has provided a tremendous mining and economic resource for the Cartersville, Georgia mining district. And last but not least, we have a lovely trilobite fossil that my daughter gave me for my birthday. Trilobites were creatures that swarmed the shallow, warm seas of the Cambrian period between 550 and 500 million years ago. Rodinia supercontinent had just rifted apart. All the pieces were sinking, and these warm, shallow seas were covering most of the continents of the world. And in addition to that, these continents had moved via the processes of plate tectonics from the cold uh, southern hemisphere latitudes up into more warm latitudes where trilobites could thrive. They ruled the world during Cambrian and much of Ordovician time.